Okay, I'm going to introduce antibiotics early in the uh, course here. Not that it's always introduced this way, but I think it's it's nice because a lot of times most textbooks wait till like the 27th or 28th chapter to finally introduce antibiotics. I mean, I think you can kind of get an intuitive understanding of how these antibiotics work um, without all the previous knowledge, uh, you know, before in the textbook. So basically, antibiotics selectively control bacteria growth. All right. And antibiotics are chemical compounds produced by microbes that selectively kill other microbial species. So essentially, these are defense mechanisms that these um, bacteria have. They have these defense mechanisms, and um, they produce these agents, and they're usually specific. They, they're specified for a particular part of the bacteria, such as the um, cell wall, or maybe it's DNA and RNA synthesis, DNA and RNA synthesis, etc. So these compounds selectively target structures specific to microbes. Those would be, a good example would be the bacterial cell wall. And um, what I have over here is a picture of penicillin, and this is actually the molecular structure as well of penicillin. So most people know that the uh, discovery of penicillin was by Alexander Fleming, and that was in 1928. So what's so beneficial about penicillin is that it mimics part of the bacterial cell wall, okay? So it binds to the biosynthetic proteins involved in peptidoglycan synthesis and prevents the cell wall from forming properly. Okay, that's what's going on here. It's actually invo it's involved in cell wall formation. It mimics a portion that is normally used in the um, cell wall formation. And what it ends up doing is disrupting. It makes it weaker, easier to burst, um, not as strong as it normally should be. And this is what's called the beta-lactam ring, okay? And this ring over here is where all the activity of penicillin really occurs. So this is sort of the active area of the drug is this beta-lactam ring. And there's several other antibiotics that share a similar ring. A lot of times there's just different groups attached to the ring, different functional groups attached to the ring, okay? And getting back to what we talked about before, the drug is actually bactericidal, okay? So that means it kills the bacteria. And it doesn't just inhibit its growth. It kills bacteria, and that's because actively growing cells will lice without the support of the cell wall. So as I said before, it mimics a part of the cell wall, ends up weakening the cell wall, and as the cell grows, it ends up lysing. So what I want to introduce now is basically the different modes of action of antibiotics. So there's, there's a lot of different modes of antibiotics. Uh, modes of action for these antibiotics. And the interesting thing about, about this in general is that, and the reason antibiotics are very effective for human use, is that these tend to focus, again, selectively on things that the bacteria have that most, you know, eukaryotic cells don't have, okay? They focus on specific things unique to bacteria, is what I'm basically getting at here. They focus on very specific things unique to bacteria, so that when you take this compound in a pill form, or, it, or if it's synthesized in the lab, you take it in a pill form, you're not going to be harmed by it. It's not going to damage anything that you have, okay? And some of the more prominent um, modes of action are, of course, cell wall synthesis, because like I said, uh, no eukaryote has peptidoglycan cell wall, okay? So cell wall synthesis is a, is a great place if I, if I want to design an antibiotic to, a, to attack the bacteria without affecting the host or without affecting the person who's infected by the, um, by the uh, bacteria. So an example, of course, is penicillin, which blocks transpeptidation in peptidoglycan synthesis. And we'll talk more de in more detail about that in, a, in future videos. Um, another one is disruption of the cell membrane. Okay, so you can disrupt the integrity of the cell membrane. So vanamycin is a, um, is a um, example, and that disrupts a potassium transporter. So we know that a lot of these transporters are in the cell membrane. And uh, if you disrupt the potassium transporter, obviously you're going to disrupt the ion concentration in the cell and several other things, so it definitely could um, cause some problems. So DNA and RNA synthesis is, of course, another place um, to look. And a common place of disruption is DNA gyrase, okay, because DNA gyrase is important for bacteria. Others can be uh, metabolic inhibitors, and a good example of the metabolic inhibitors are the sulfa drugs which inhibit the synthesis of THF. 
which is an important cofactor in the synthesis of nucleic acids. So again, you're indirectly affecting the synthesis of nucleic acids, but it's a metabolic inhibitor because we're talking about a metabolic pathway that produces this um, molecule. Um, protein synthesis is another place, and protein synthesis, remember, we have a 70S ribosome, right? So eukaryotic cells have the um, 80S ribosome, prokaryotes got this 70S ribosome, so you can actually block the modes of action of RNA polymerase or affect the 70S ribosome. So you can deal with the RNA polymerase because remember, again, prokaryotes have a different RNA polymerase. They have a much simpler RNA polymerase, okay? It's not as complex as the prokaryotic RNA polymerase. So you can definitely use that as a target because it's not the same as the RNA polymerase that we have. Or that is, so if we're trying to give, you know, find drugs, antibiotic drugs for human use, it's not going to be the same. It's a perfect target. So is the 70S ribosome, which are both unique to bacteria. So those are some of the common modes of action. And um, also, we'll, I guess we'll get into talking here about um, antimicrobial activity. So no antibiotic drug affects all microbes. All right, that should be obvious to begin with. Not all of them are going to, um, you know, be useful. We know this, okay? We know this by the amount of, of uh, antibiotic-resistant drugs, for instance. We have to keep coming up with different uh, antibiotics to attack these organisms. So antimicrobial drugs are classified based on the organisms they affect, okay? So which organisms do they affect? and we classify based on that. And that's why it's important to identify or to be able to identify unknown bacteria in the lab because we have to know what you're infected with. So they have what's called a spectrum of activity, okay? And the spectrum of activity is basically how many species does it affect? Um, you know, and a good example, again, I always go back to penicillin. That's my favorite example. I think it's the most common and easiest one for most people to grasp. And um, Penicillin has a narrow spectrum of activity, okay? It primarily kills these gram-positive bacteria. And remember, it attacks or it, or it weakens the cell wall. Gram-positive bacteria have a thick peptidoglycan cell wall. So if you have a thick peptidoglycan cell wall, um, it's quite obvious that a drug that affects that cell wall is really going to affect the organism as a whole. And in most cases, like, in, in the, well, I shouldn't say in most cases. In the case of penicillin specifically, it kills the bacteria. So then we might want to go on to discuss, you know, how do we determine, you know, what the effects of this and how efficient this antibiotic is. And in those cases, we use what's called a minimum inhibitory concentration, okay? And the minimum inhibitory concentration reflects the antibiotic efficiency. So MIC is defined as the lowest concentration of a drug that will prevent the growth of an organism. So essentially what you do is you set up a serial dilution, okay? You set up several test tubes and you basically dilute this thing out. And as you go with the dilution, you'll eventually find, you'll be able to see, probably just by the cloudiness of the, of the liquid medium that you're diluting out, um, which ones grew and which ones didn't grow, okay? And you're going to pick out the one that, that essentially did not grow. And that's going to be your minimum inhibitory um, concentration. So we do not know if the drug is bacterial static or bactericidal, okay? We won't know that from the minimal inhibitory concentration because remember, this is the minimum inhibitory concentration. It's the concentration required just to make it um, stop growing, okay? Prevent the growth. To find the minimum lethal concentration, okay, you have to plate the liquid that you diluted out. So you have to plate the liquid that you diluted out from the MIC and if no colonies grow, then the MIC is also the MLC. So it also would be the minimum lethal concentration. In other cases, it may very well not be, 